Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, November 29th. Welcome into the morning medical update. While many of us who were able to take a little bit of a break, we are learning more and more that COVID did not. In fact, this new variant is drawing mm. concern and leading to more and more travel restrictions, many that have actually happened overnight. So this is called Omicron. It's this new variant and its origins come from South Africa. So to give you kind of an example of the impact it's having already as we're learning more and more, this weekend alone, 13 out of 61 passengers um, out of South Africa into the Netherlands tested positive for Omicron. This morning, we're gonna break down what we know about it and what the worries are. Um, it has, is it spreading quickly? How long has it been spreading before it was discovered last week. Uh, make sure to get your questions in today. We know you'll have them. Go to YouTube, Facebook. You can always email those to the Medical News Network. You find links right there on your screen. Also, we want to remind you that November is Bone Marrow Donor Awareness Month, and we promised to bring you this really great story today about that young man from Chicago who came down here to KC to help save a life. Well, we didn't run a rush through it, so we're going to focus on COVID today, and then we're going to set that story for a whole other day. It deserves its very own day, so we'll get to that very soon, but let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson joining us with our numbers. How are we looking after we came out of this really long weekend? Yeah, you know, the numbers have really been steady all weekend since Thursday when we didn't have, didn't have a show. Today, we have 21 active infections. Again, for the last, you know, couple weeks now, we've been staying in those high teens, low 20s. Uh, today we have 21 active infections with seven in the ICU and four on the ventilator. Of those 21 active infections, seven are fully vaccinated. Unfortunately, we don't have much more detail about that. Um, and we have 15 in the recovery period as well, so a total of 36. And unfortunately, Hayes, though, however, has increased. They actually have 15 active infections and 12 in that recovery period as well. So out there we've seen that their active infections have increased. And again, that is such an important thing because their hospital capacity is just smaller than ours. And yeah, we keep seeing this spreading across the country. We've got a couple of graphs, if that's all right, to, to take a look yeah, at please, if we can, guys. If we'll go ahead and roll a couple of these pictures this morning. We want to talk a little bit about where we are with Delta and where we're headed. First of all, our coronavirus um, uh, uh, vaccine tracker. This is just an example of what's to come. You know, we don't spend a lot of time talking. Uh, we talk about, go, let's go get our vaccine. We have three approved in the United States. But if you look at this graphic, it demonstrates how many we have that are still in development. Over 56 new vaccines are in development. You can see as you go past each of these arrows down to where we are in terms of clinical trials, but lots of hope out there around new vaccinations coming about. So pretty good stuff. It's out in the New York Times. Next slide. So this curve represents the different ways we've experienced in the United States. And this is an American graph, but it looks different for different parts of the world. But you can see how the different strains of coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 have presented themselves. And when you look at how SARS-CoV-2 is constructed, imagine a family tree and you said, okay, well, here's this branch of the tree. Here's another branch of the tree. We're all um, I'm part of the same SARS-CoV-2 tree. But Delta is a variant. It's actually a family of, 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 uh, or, uh, of that, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 area. And you can see how Delta overtook the country um, last, late last spring and into the summer. It kind of pushed aside all the other variants. And you say, well, why did that one really do it? One of the reasons it did it is because it's so transmissible. So it's easier for you to get the Delta variant than it is to get another variant. And so because it is so transmissible, gets into you so easily, that's one of the reasons that Delta variant um, has pushed aside all the others. It's also one of the reasons that some of the other variants of concern like Lambda and, and um, Mu didn't really take off as much because they aren't quite as transmissible as the Delta variant. Let's go to the next slide. This is a slide of hot spots in the United States, and you can see that um, a few weeks ago we showed this, and Colorado was a huge hot spot, Montana, Idaho. It's begun to cool in the Mountain West, but now you can see what's happening in Kansas. And to uh, Hawkeye's earlier point, the number of cases, acute cases in Hayes, is almost as high as the number of acute cases here at KU, which generally just doesn't happen. You know, we have we have 21, uh, Hayes has 15. That's a lot of acute cases out in Hayes. And, and I think it just demonstrates that because the further west you go, we're seeing a lot of hot spots in, in, in Kansas. And it's beginning now to broach into Missouri and Iowa. You can see how hot Michigan, Wisconsin, and some of the northern states are, even up in the Maine Vermont and New Hampshire where they've had a lot of vaccination. Let's go to the next slide. 
The next slide is a risk level slide. And as you can see, Kansas, which had cooled off, is now really hot again. Missouri's hot. You can see as you go into Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, lots of hot areas. And so Pennsylvania, New York, lots of areas have taken off. The South has been relatively spared. But if you watch this map carefully, what you'll know, if you, if you kind of watch it over a period of time, it's beginning to encroach on the Southeast now. So expect it to head that direction next. This is important because what we're going to do now is shift gears and talk a little bit about what's going on with Omicron. I want to call it Omicron, but fortunately one of our, our folks who are work here took some Greek uh, um, language or whatever, yeah. Latin, whatever you call this, uh, back in, uh, he studied the Greek alphabet uh, in college. He's like, no, no, you're saying it all wrong. It's Omicron. Mm -hmm. So indeed. Us uh, say something Brainiac. wrong. I was, I, I was saying it wrong earlier. <laughs> I was too. So, you know, this started, um, we think, in South Africa. Actually, it may have started in Botswana, which is an area right mm -hmm. around South Africa. Botswana has an, an HIV population, and it, it's being suggested this came about in an HIV population um, because folks with HIV don't respond, couldn't eliminate the virus as well, and so the virus had more time to uh, make mistakes because that's how these viruses develop mutations. They make mistakes in their replication. Viruses aren't particularly mistake-free when they replicate, and as a result of those 30,000 RNA um, uh, uh, building blocks in, a, in this virus, you can get some that have a mutation in it. And we're going to take a look at that in a moment. What we know is that Omicron is spreading rapidly uh, and, and it's probably being discovered more than it's being it continues, I mean, it continues to spread, but it's also being discovered in multiple countries, including in Canada, Scotland, Britain, you know, Germany, Italy, France, other places. And, and what we know is as it spreads, it shouldn't surprise us that it's spreading like that because it appears to be highly transmissible. It's interesting, um, there was one flight from Johannesburg, or two flights that went to the Netherlands. They had 600 plus people on them. 10% of those passengers have now tested positive for the Omicron variant. Mm -hmm. There are regions in South Africa where 90% of the cases being presented are the Omicron variant. What's also interesting in those areas is that the physicians there and the health minister, the health ministry is reporting the symptoms tend to be, they appear to be early on at least, and again, we're building this airplane while we fly it. They may be a little milder than the Delta symptoms. They predominantly present with nausea, dizziness, maybe a dry cough and lightheadedness and fatigue. No loss of sense of taste or smell so far. They haven't seen the severe respiratory illness, but it's still really early in our discovery of these cases. We don't really know how long it's been out there. It's suggested it's probably at least a month or two months, and it's been circulating, and it's just now being discovered. And um, it appears to be highly transmissible. Let's go to the next slide for just a minute. If we look at this, this is a picture graph of the, um, the, the genome, if you will. This is the genomic sequ the sequencing and the different parts of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And like I said, there's about 30,000 messenger RNA molecules in this. And in what happens in this new um, Omicron variant is there are about 50 deletions in it. Those deletions, to the next slide, typically occur in um, different parts of it, but especially what concerns us is the spike mutation, or the spike protein. So the spike protein, you can see where some of the different mutations are with the different colors in this graph. And the fear is that this now makes it more transmissible and may be easier to get into your cells. What's, again, interesting is that we don't really know yet how severe it is. We, what's being presented or what's being reported are milder symptoms that isn't true in the Delta variant. Um, it's not caused a spike in hospitalizations or death yet in South Africa, which is really good news. What we saw in that earlier graph, remember we showed how Delta spread and how it can be the dominant wave? Some epidemiologists and virologists are predicting that Omicron, because it's going, it appears to be two to eight times more transmissible than the Delta variant, may spread like the Delta variant and may become the dominant type. Those who want to look at this with rose-colored glasses, and again, it's way, way early to speculate, are saying this may be a, um, a ray of sunshine in this whole story because it spreads, it may be spreading more easily, and at least in South Africa and these regions, it's displaced the Delta variant, not associated thus far, but it's really early with high hospitalizations and death. If it could actually be a less severe disease than Delta, that might actually turn out to be a good thing. But the problem is, and what I think we have to recognize, is that this mutation, these mutations, even if they're less severe, it also says that other mutations could arise. 
So if you step back and you ask yourself, what's the answer? How do we make sure that we try to contain this? The rules are always the same, right? The rules of infection prevention control travel with you wherever you go, even into this moment, they keep you safe going forward. So watch your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, get vaccinated. We don't know how well the vaccines work against this, but the most folks in the, that I'm reading, and I'm gonna to turn to Hawkeye in just a moment, are suggesting that vaccination uh, people believe, especially not just antibody, but all the other layers of vaccination will help keep you safe against the Omicron variant. So Hawkeye, what are you reading? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we know very little about the science and we know that it is spreading, but I think we have to remember the epidemiologic factors in that. Are people just gathering more? Are they getting together? What are the restrictions in those places that would cause it to spread more? So I, you know, I am really skeptical of all this new information until we have actual proof and data to support that. We do know that Omicron does have several uh, mutations. I think they said over 30 mutations in the spike protein itself. Okay, that's interesting. But we have to understand what are those mutations? What kind of amino acid substitutions do they lead to that may have that spike difference? So there are several that are found on other uh, variants as well. So the D614G amino acid substitution, you know, that was one found very early on in probably May or April of 2020. We know that made um, the virus a little bit easier to infect cells because of what it does to spike. There are other mutations, or more importantly, amino acid substitutions in that spike protein. We know that people are concerned that it will evade the immune system. Haven't really seen much about what they're talking about other than maybe the antibody immune system, but we know in all of the other variants that there are conserved regions on the spike protein that don't change, that still um, our T cells can react to. We also know that you get a much broader antibody response to variants you haven't even seen if you are vaccinated. We have seen that there was a, a recent, uh, there have been several articles about that, but especially a recent one in the science update from CDC about COVID-19 as well. But what are the other mutations also? We know that Delta has a specific mutation in the N protein, which helps it pack more RNA into that virus part particle than say the original Wuhan strain. Also, how does it interact with our immune system? We know um, there are some mutations or changes in uh, the open reading frame, ORP1A, which has to do with how the virus evades our innate immune response, especially interferon. So we really need to get a lot more information and data about the science and the, the, the virology of this, but also look at the epidemiology and how, what are the people's behaviors that maybe are allowing it to spread quicker. So there are a lot uh, of points and information that we still need to get. I'm skeptical until we can see exactly what this is and how it does. Remember early on, we thought that children weren't affected by coronavirus at all. We thought it didn't affect pregnant women at all. We've come to learn that those things are, are vastly different from what we thought initially. And so it will take a little bit of time. Obviously, they are trying to move as fast as possible to get the best data possible. But the best thing you can do, as Dr. Stite said, continue to do those Swiss cheese things that we were talking about because it's levels of all those interventions to help protect you, but especially vaccination. Now, you said it's an interesting story, though. There was a South African um, family medicine physician who um, who reported this to the health ministry because what was she said that what was odd to her is that all of a sudden, it was like uh, over a period of days, the, the presenting symptoms of her patients were much different who were testing positive because it had gone from more the Delta variant, I lost my sense of taste and smell, to I'm dizzy, I'm lightheaded, and I got a dry cough and I'm tired. And so she said a very different yeah. symptom constellation. So don't know why that is. Um, uh, to Hawkeye's point, we don't know yet. It, it appears that it arose in a province of South Africa where it, that's what's been reported the most and mostly by the lay press, to, to, to Dana's point, that um, that the, the, the um, that it's in a province mostly of, uh, where 75% of people are not vaccinated because there's not that much vaccination yet in South Africa. And it's, in, it's a younger population. So we don't really know how yeah. severe it is gonna be or how severe it's not gonna be. And I think uh, that's why I say, we, you know, you've heard us say on this plane, on this show many times, well, on a plane really, that we build this airplane <laughs> while we fly it. And uh, we always were going to know more. And there's this two week news cycle that appears to occur. 
Uh, at least early on, though, it's up to 90% of regions in South Africa are now reporting the Omicron as, a, as the spread, as the predominant variant, not Delta anymore. It's displaced Delta. So that, that, that's interesting, I think, because yeah. it's just a point of fact. I think it's interesting that the symptoms appear to be different. Um, we will have to wait and see what happens, because it will take us six or eight weeks to know the true severity of the disease. Yeah, and what I would say is, remember early on, too, we thought that uh, you know, people with coronavirus had cough, fever, and shortness of breath, and that was all we were looking for. So again, we're, we're just trying to take it one day at a time and just understand that things do change it. And then we got to understand that people can have no symptoms at all. And so I think it's very difficult to say this is exactly how this virus infection prevents uh, or presents. And just remember, a lot of these things have to do with the necessarily the substitution in the spike protein that they're looking at. And we've seen these substitutions or these changes in other variants. So a couple of them being in a couple, one being in another one, things of that nature. So these are not fully unheard of or new, or new ver uh, substitutions or changes. And really, we need, just need to get down to see how much more fit or differently fit is this virus, and can it compete against Delta? Um, certainly, we thought that was for the, the, the Mu or Mu variant. But what we have seen is that kind of popped up, and now if you look at particularly in Colombia, it's gone back down, and Delta has become more, uh, more predominant as well. So still a lot of information to garner, I think. Do we have any reporter questions on the line? Okay, I do have one from uh, Rebecca over at Channel 9. All of this, and now Blue Valley High School start their mask optional policy today. So um, others in the metro have had this policy lifted for a while. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, do the numbers look like they support mask optional policies? You know, I, I just, again, I can't comment on yep. the social needs of the kids in that school district. That, that you have to yep. take that. I'm just going to go from the medical side, right? Oh, I, I'd like to see you try. Yeah, just no, I'd be that. terrible yeah, about you it. Try to stay in your lane. Man now. But I'm people want to hear your opinion I'm going to stay in the lane. Uh, you know, I, I think we all ought to still be wearing masks, but it, it, it's a simple why. You look at our numbers, they are really not down to the numbers they were last fall when we last suspended mask mandates. Um, you can see it coming at us from western Kansas and into our areas. The heat map is clearly demonstrating how the wave is moving our direction. And I think by taking masks off, just as people are going inside, just as things get cold, we're just asking for trouble, and I think trouble will find its way here, and I, see, I expect our numbers to rise because of that. You know, it's, it's, it's that old thing, uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And I think, um, I, think it's, I, think it's, you know, I think it's a little early to do it from a pure health medical standpoint. Now, again, I, I can't offer, uh, I, I don't, I'm not in that school, I don't know the needs of that, th that, those kids in that school as well, and those parents and that, that administration have to be the judge of that. But from just a pure medical standpoint uh, across our area, I, I, I'm, I was really pleased to see Wyandotte County extend their mask mandate until January the 6th. And they are optional, so you can wear your mask. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, and I still do, so I, I still wear my mask, so. Okay, so we're getting a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna kind of, I have a few for you, but I wanna jump in and get to our community questions as well. Um, if we can go ahead and get those started. So um, Rebecca is asking, aren't the variants coming from immune compromised individuals? Well, Hawk, I don't, what, what I read yeah. was that this appeared to have started in an HIV population in Botswana um, because people with HIV if, especially who are not as well treated, and you know, treatment is scarcer in Africa than it is in the U.S. Um, what happens is that your body isn't able to respond as well to the virus and get rid of it rapidly, mm -hmm. and so as a result, the virus stays and reproduces yeah. and reproduces and reproduces. The way mutations arise um, is that the viral replication is not especially mistake-proof. It actually is very mistake prone. It's kind of like watching me try to play baseball. It's very mistake prone. And uh, what happens is there are a lot of errors. And when those errors occur, that there are these substitutions or deletions in these proteins that make, the, that make the virus. And so it replicates, but it keeps making all these mistakes. Some of those mistakes make a very, make a very you know, you can kind of knock off the virus and make it less transmissible, et cetera. But then there are other mistakes that help protect it against your immune system. And because viruses make so many mistakes, they keep getting made. The way that your body can help prevent that is it gets rid of the virus. But when it sits in your airway and it continues to replicate, then pretty soon it's essentially fine-tuning itself 
to stay in your airway. And, 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 and in this case, it's in your, in your lung. And so as a result, the virus makes those mistakes. The mutations that are keeping it whole and keeping it in the airway are the ones that survive. And then when that person coughs, they can deliver that to somebody else. And that's how this whole thing gets started. And it's interesting that you note that viruses of different lineage of SARS-CoV-2 have some of these mistake patterns in them. And that's because it's probably a survival advantage, Hawkeye. Yeah, you know, I think it is just more of a, a consequence and a function of just overall uh, continued um, replication in, in hosts. Uh, you do have that in-host evolution when it changes with every replication cycle, like you said. Many of these uh, mutations or substitutions that go on within the virus, 90% uh, of them don't lead to any changes or any problems. Certainly you can have those. And then when you have multiple of them building up within the genome, that can change the fitness or the dynamics of that virus, and that's what we're looking for. We also note that it's not just in those immunocompromised populations. It's really when any time the virus has a chance to continue to replicate, uh, for instance, in an unvaccinated population. We, we know some of these mutations can arise spontaneously on their own just in cell culture. And so, but I think the main point of that, Steve, is you're, you're correct. It is important for everybody to help reduce the overall burden of replication throughout the community, throughout your community, through you individually, and the way to do that is with vaccination as well. So here's a good way, good way to think about it. We should call this the Patrick Mahomes moment. You're gonna ask me, why Patrick Mahomes? Why Patrick Mahomes? Okay, there you go. So Matt, Patrick Mahomes is a non-classic quarterback. He doesn't always have the same normal footwork. He throws his, I mean, he has the weirdest throws, underhanded, he's kind of a wizard out there, right? But if you looked at him from a classical standpoint, you say he makes a lot of mistakes in his form. But those mistakes have allowed him to do some amazing things. He survived really well. Now you take another quarterback, and you're like, they make a lot of mistakes, but they keep throwing a bunch of interceptions, they keep fumbling the ball, et cetera, things, terrible things happen. That's a quarterback who's not gonna survive. Mahomes, because his mistakes have led to this great place, he survives. Think about that in the viral world now. I'm not trying to call Patrick Mahomes a virus, although maybe the Oakland Raiders see him that way. But you know, or the Las Vegas Raiders, sorry. But, the, but if you look at him, what you think of it, think about the virus as being, okay, are you having a Mahomes moment? Or are you having a Bubby Brister moment? Nobody will remember who Bubby Brister is. That was an old quarterback, Pittsburgh Steelers, mm -hmm. didn't last but very long. But did he stink it up? Was he not? Yeah, dead? he does. That's, okay. kind of the, that's kind of the story. I'm trying to think of somebody else who's a little more, little more current, but I don't, want, I don't want to hammer on anybody. So let's just say, you know, some guy who's not very good. Okay. So just think of the, as this, each time the virus evolves, the Delta variant, for example, it has its Mahomes moment because it has things it's doing that are a survival advantage to it. And so it, it, it can do it. And, and again, you know, I, I think to Hawkeye's point is really early. We don't have really good data, but at least in South Africa, what we're seeing is that in different regions, the Omicron is displacing. Whether or not that will continue to go, we don't know yet. Okay, now I understand. Well, so it makes sense, it right? Down, if we talk about football, it always makes sense. Football, or if you make some sort of Ted Lasso one reference. One syllable words helps. Uh, yes, it does. I could, does. Do, I could do a red syllable, one syllable word, but I can't say it on the air. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's coming one of these days. All right, so um, Brittany has a question. Uh, goes Going back to what you showed off the top of the show, your maps, um, Florida has had the least COVID restrictions, but looks the best on the heat map. Any reason why you think that's why they're doing so well down there? Yeah, I think it just, I think this next wave hasn't hit them yet. Just give, yeah. give, give them about three give months and let's see where we are and, and we can answer they that question. They were pretty bad in that wave recently. They were really bad. So. And they actually had some of the worst, this was their worst wave, yeah. if I recall. I and just... they may have enough host immunity left from that. They're going to be a little resistant. But what typically happens with this thing is it runs in these waves, right? You get past one wave and then another wave starts as soon as we relax public restrictions. So you're right. The whole Southeast doesn't look so severe. Uh, no, it does doesn't Florida. Too look like to me there's any reporting there as it's all yeah. just white so. they probably quit reporting so all oh, looks good but at the end of the <laughs> okay. day watch because if you, if you watch these maps regularly mm -hmm. it's encroaching on the southeast it's coming to the southeast and it will come to the southeast especially as things get colder remember it hasn't really gotten cold and they and and, and and people really go inside masks off host immunity starts to wane low vaccination rate predictably here it comes so what does this new variant then mean? Um, when we looked at the when we look at the maps and when we look at Delta and we go back 20 months, I know we don't want to play guessing games, but that's going to be a question people want to know, especially yeah. as we enter into cold weather and holidays. If we had to make a prediction, a really wise prediction, what would it look like as far as this new variant? 
coming yeah, I, here, I, I not don't just. Know. And then, it's hard to know, really. I think you go anywhere from it could sputter and die, okay. which is what happened with the mu variant that the Hawkeye mentioned a few moments ago. Um, or the or Lambda variant, or, um, and remember, they were the dominant variant in different countries mm -hmm. for a while, and now they're not. Now Delta is. Delta displaced them. Or it could be much more highly transmissible and um, hopefully in, no worse than Delta or even better than Delta, highly transmissible, and then it could begin to displace the Delta variant, and over a period of months could become the Delta, the, the dominant strain in the U.S., we don't have enough information to know right now, and we can't all extrapolate from South Africa because we don't, because again, different vaccination rates, different endemic infection rate, different amount of people who have already contact, contracted SARS-CoV-2 along the way. So it's hard to extract that information and say this is what's going to happen. It's way early yet. And, and I think the other thing we have to remember is that in the world of viruses, this happens all the time. We act like this is new Hawkeye, like, oh my God, look at what just happened. Well, the reality is this happens with the common cold virus and the influenza all the time. Mm. This is normal viral behavior. There is nothing that this virus is doing yeah. that's really abnormal in terms of how it's behaving. It just got us a little sicker than some of the other viruses. Yeah, absolutely. And we have the science and technology, the ability to look for this and do the surveillance to really understand what's going on. Thankfully, and we are getting more surveillance available to us so that we can identify these variants in a real time, quicker process than before as well. So I think that's helpful. Judy wants to know why does this virus seem to have more variants than the flu? I don't know that it does have more virus. Again, yeah. I think you just get there's so much popular press on it, and people are so concerned, and they're closing the borders so fast, yeah. which is interesting. There's some editorials out there that, that may not be the right approach. But at any rate, the, um, uh, you know, I think you're just hearing about it so much more uh, because it's so hot as far as news go. But actually, yeah. influenza has a lot of variants, rhinovirus has a lot of variants. This is part of what made, made mm -hmm. HIV so hard to try and track. Yeah, I know, certainly, and it's really difficult, although we do it sometimes, it is difficult to compare influenza to this virus. Again, influenza is a completely different virus. The genome is completely different. You have different types of events that change the influenza virus. The other thing, Steve, is we've lived with influenza for how many hundreds of years, yeah. thousands of years. Our body is used to that in general as a population, as homo sapiens. And so it's it's really difficult to put that, um, that moniker on there. It, it, mutates more, mutates less. They are just different types of viruses. They have different things going on. Um, and so I think that is why we are seeing this. But also, it is new to our species, as we said. Um, and so this can happen. And so I think we go from the original Wuhan strain to see what we have now. I think that is one more piece of evidence that really makes it hard to believe that this was created or worked on or enhanced in a laboratory as we see the amount of enhan enhancement that has occurred throughout these past 18 months, on its just own. in natural, on its own, yep. But, but, but you know, variant, I mean, viruses do mutate rapidly because they, um, they, they have a lot, they make a lot of mistakes as they reproduce, and those mistakes lead to the mutations. You made a good point, though. This is very new for all of, all of us. It's all, regular, yeah. regular people, yeah, <laughs> it's very most, new. I mean, if we had the guys from that, uh, This Week in Virology on, they'd be saying, yeah, well, okay, you're just new to the story here. <laughs> the yeah, story's been going on for a long time. We're late to the game, no doubt about it, just for us regular folks. Okay, so Carla's asking, with Pfizer saying that they may need to adjust for Omicron, and it would be ready in about 100 days. Mm -hmm. um, should people wait to get their booster so they can get this adjusted vaccine? No, heck no. <clears throat> Go get your vaccination. Oh, yeah. Look, so the Delta, the, the Biden administration talked to the folks at Johnson & Johnson, uh, Moderna, and Pfizer to say, hey, what will it take if you need to adjust? How do you adjust it? They're all saying, look, we're already studying the thing, Novavax, we're already studying it. We can make the adjustment. It takes us 100 days. Tell us how long will it take. Do we have to put it through all these trials, et cetera? There's a lot of questions out there. But it, it, so I think people are looking at it in case they do need to make yeah. the adjustments and they're preparing to make the adjustments by already getting their va vaccine ready for that. And I think there will come a day when we are going to do that uh, pretty rapidly. But uh, I don't know what it'll be about the Omicron one or not. Mm -hmm. But the key is that it, we don't know yet, to be fair, we don't know yet how much vaccination works against Omicron. We don't really know. What we hope is true and what has been true thus far with all the other variants 
is that vaccination does help protect you because you still, to Hawkeye's earlier point, you have the spike protein, you just still have all other uh, levels of immunity. And, and Doc Hawk, I, I'm going to guess that the vaccine is still going to help us even against the Omicron variant. Yeah, again, I'm skeptical and I would like... And I'm Which one are you skeptical about? That? I'm skeptical that the immunity from the vaccines do not provide immunity enough yeah. for Omicron. You know, but again, that is in what we we're talking about historically, where we thought we had to maybe pivot the vaccine. And we know Moderna was working on a South African variant yep. strain or spike. The Delta variant. Or there. Was that uh, Delta or Beta? It was, it was Beta. They it was were beta. working on the Beta one. Early and then they all on. worked on the Delta mm -hmm. one, too. Yep. Early on. And then what they saw was actually the vaccine continues to protect you against those very important things that we want to protect you. Again, it's not every case. It's those cases that have to go to the hospital, the ICU, and of course dying. And so we, we know the vaccines have continued to provide good uh, protection against that. But we know, my point is we know that Moderna was working to pivot their vaccine very quickly. That is one of the nice things about this technology is they can pivot. And I think they are working on that if it's needed. So they pivot and work on that in the event that it is not effective. If they find out it is affected, like they did with Delta, no need to change. Is that That's what I hear? That's the story. Smart people say. Yes. Okay. I, okay. So then they're going to wait. Yeah. Now. No. And they're already pivoted. I think they, they've already said we're all working on yeah. this. Pfizer said, "Yeah, we'll be ready within days." With our, I would suspect they've yeah. worked on it over yeah. the weekend because okay. the sequence is available so that they can develop that mRNA. Yeah. Okay. And one of the cool things, and this, we just have to say this out loud for a minute: the amount of sharing going on across the world about these different things is really important because. Um, the South African government shared the, the they, they sequenced it. They shared it. Everybody got the gen genomic sequencing right away, which allowed them to work on it and start tracking it in their own countries, and allowed folks to take a look and try to start developing the vaccines for it. So, um, or any type of modification they wanted to do. So that amount of sharing is great, and we we should applaud all the people who, who are working and, and continuing to do that. Terry wants to know: uh, Did the Delta variant? come from South Africa? Where did Delta come from? Uh, India, I believe. India, India was, identi yeah, was identified there. Uh, Mimi wants to know if everyone is vaccinated, mm. would having 20 people over mm. for some holiday cheer be a mistake if they're not masked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, again, and I was going to put this, uh, I think I might have said it before, if not, I was going to. We have to understand that in the face of Omicron right now, we are also dealing with an increase in number of cases in our community as well, and that's just with Delta. And that is coupled with the fact that our lowest point of running seven-day average cases per day got nowhere near as low as it did prior to this last surge. So I think you have to understand that the virus is circulating the community at a very high level. If you invite somebody to your house, if you invite 20 people, even if they're vaccinated, there's probably a good chance somebody has been recently exposed and may uh, have the infection and able to spread it. Um, that being said, you know, vaccination is going to help. If you're up to date on your booster recently, that is going to help. Just try to understand those facts and the assumptions that, you know, out of 20 people, somebody might likely may have it and be able to, uh, to still spread a little bit or have some low level of transmission. Yeah, I was trying to talk to one of my family members last night. There's, a, for various reasons, a bunch of our family are coming up from Texas for um, uh, the get together in January. And I was trying to talk to him and he hasn't been vaccinated yet. I was trying, mm. Oh man, dude, yeah. you got to get that vaccine. Yeah. You really shouldn't come without that. And, and it's just hard because you want everybody to be vaccinated because we know it's so much safer. There's still a lot of hesitancy, though. It's interesting. People are still really afraid of the side effects of the vaccination. And all I can say is, gosh, we've given over 100,000 yeah. doses here. I think you talked about that last week. And uh, billions worldwide. And the, the likelihood of being injured from a vaccine is far less than your likelihood of getting COVID and then getting seriously ill or having long haul symptoms. So if you just look at it, I mean, the risk benefit analysis, there's just absolutely, there's just no question which one is riskier. Jay wants to know, is it true that that vaccinated individuals provide the greatest risk for more harmful variants, maybe unvaccinated people? Maybe that's... Well, maybe, I don't know what, maybe they're a vaccine no. doubter. So, but, yeah. but the, 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 those who are unvaccinated are t six times more likely to spread the yeah. disease and 12 times more likely to get really, really ill from the disease. Yeah. So that statement would be absolutely incorrect. 
unvaccinated people are much more likely to spread the disease and, to, and have more mutations. Variants? Uh, and I think variants. I've seen yes. that too. That is a uh, another misinformation campaign. Vaccinated people are not more at more risk of creating the variants. So Made up news network. I think don't yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Well, how do we get ahead of it then? As a world, as a community here locally, as it spreads, how do you get ahead of it? We hear about this new variant from, you know, last week. We're waiting this two-week window to find out more information. Do we just lie and wait? What do you do? Put masks um, back on? Get vaccinated. <laughs> make okay. sure you're vaccinated. Make sure you got your booster. And make sure that, you know, you, you, you follow the rules of infection prevention and control. I don't think we should go into a social shutdown. I'm not going to advocate for any of that. Yeah. It's not like that right now. It's real, We're way, way premature. But it's not premature to say Delta variant is still out there. Mm -hmm. It's still high risk. We still know it has a, it, it, it can be very lethal. We don't know that much about the Omicron one right now. So you don't really need to react to that news. You re need to react to the Delta news here in the U.S. Yeah, I think that, that's exactly right, Steve. Go get vaccinated. Um, even if it is Omicron, even if there is some reduced in, uh, protection from the vaccines, we know the vaccines, if that is true, will be coming out with a new one. But right now, still go get vaccinated. Delta continues to predominate. Um, the issue is we don't want people to go through natural infection because we have seen what happened in the pre-vaccine area, what happens with natural infection and the amount of hospitalization and severe illness and death that leads to. And so we know we can protect you from that. Please go get vaccinated. That is the best thing to do. So what you're saying is we don't need a new variant. Let's just listen to what we know already. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Don't react to the, the variant should go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we've Delta, just been Delta, talking Delta. about this long enough that we don't need information from a new variant. Just keep doing no, what we've been doing. No, it's all, again, what do the rules of infection prevention and control do? They keep you safe and they travel with you wherever you go. I'm making you a t-shirt that I'm says gonna, that. It, it, I need one. I, it needs to be a little neon sign. 100%. Okay, Carla wants to know, she said that she read this in the American Heart Association publication. She, she feels this hasn't been talked about, about mm. being concerned about vaccine and heart issues. Mm. Here come my attempt at the big words. mRNA COVID vaccines dramatically increase endothelial, endothelial, endothelial really well. inflammatory markers mm. and okay. ACS risk as measured by the PULS cardiac test. Help, yeah. Just first of all, what is that? Yeah, all first I just of all, said. misinterpreting the information. That is not, yeah. this, the real story is that heart attacks are a part and heart mm -hmm. failures are a real part of COVID disease. Mm -hmm. And there are some preliminary indications. I saw some of that data this weekend. But the same people are saying, look, we think this could happen. But we also know that it happens so rarely, you're far more at risk from COVID-19, Hawkeye. Yeah, I would say that. And we've, we've shown this and proven it in different scenarios you know if you look at the myocarditis which, which is just the heart inflammation not in the endothelial la layers which is your blood cells essentially uh, we've seen this with women in pregnancy the vaccines offer far greater protection uh, than any of the risks that they uh, can can give you or provide and we know they offer that protection against the true uh, side effects and the adverse outcomes and the comp complications that can occur from the infection itself as compared to the vaccine. So the vaccines continue to be safe. Okay, so Terry wants to know how soon after you get the booster does it take to be effective? Good for you, she got hers on Saturday. Yeah, yeah you should really start to have that, an increase in that boost probably within the, uh, the 10 days or so. Uh, but really that full protection, we are still gonna say it's at that 14 day mark. But you should start to get that a boost or that clonal expansion in those memory cells, uh, in those uh, immune cells, it pretty early on after the, the vaccine, but really by about that 10 to 14 days is when you can expect to have probably the maximal protection that it offers. All right, just get it. All right, Shannon wants to know, uh, any word on when kids uh, 11 and up will be getting boosters? Do you think we'll need them? I don't know, it's difficult. I thought I saw Dr. Fauci say not really. Uh, the way it's moving, I would assume at some point between eight and 12 months, but right now there's not been a lot of information on that and I think with Omicron coming up in, in the news cycle that's probably going to get a lot of the uh, the big bang for your buck kind of news so we'll see but right now I didn't think that there was any plan to give those pediatrics patients uh, booster dosing. Can I just go back to that question because I found the article that I knew I'd seen it this weekend and read about it the um, is actually there was an article in New England Journal of Medicine that reviewed um, very rare case reports of when people do have some inflammation of heart muscles, why that can be, or va vascular regions or blood vessels, why is that, so that they can help prevent it. 
But they go on to say, look, long COVID is terrible. COVID is terrible. Don't not get a vaccine from because of that. But if we do look at these very rare side effects, let's figure out what we can do about it. And that's really what the point of the article was. It wasn't that everybody gets these very rare yeah. side effects. It's actually just the opposite of that, yeah. is to say there are some very rare side effects. Let's go figure out what we do, mm -hmm. but don't stop. Don't get, not get vaccinated. So just mm -hmm. to be clear, that's in the New England Journal of Medicine is in there this week. Okay, just two more quick questions. Amy, why do natural immunities from ha having had COVID not outweigh the benefit from having the vaccine? Why does the natural immunity, why does a natural immunity not work better than vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I think that is continues to be an unanswered question because we know that pre Delta, we know that people got reinfected. That was a rare event. Um, we know that people sometimes did better, but sometimes people did worse. And so I think that is a fully unanswered question. What we know in a bulk of the uh, basic science or laboratory research is that those people that have had vaccination after just infection do seem to develop a more broad range of those neutralizing antibodies to variants that they hadn't seen and possibly variants that haven't arisen yet, including Omicron. Now what we're hearing is that may, that may evade that immune systems, particularly antibodies um, vaccination. But right now that's a very good question, fully unanswered. Uh, but that is why we would still recommend, and it is recommended to get vaccination after uh, having the natural infection, especially if you've had that mild infection as well. Yeah, I think there's some, again, in the New England Journal this week, they talked about how um, subsequent infections after your first infection without a vaccination tend to be a little bit milder, but tend to be is not a great reassurance. Yeah. Remember that um, those who are unvaccinated have a 12 times greater risk of dying and a six times greater risk of spreading the disease. Those data, that data is out there. It's, you can see it every day. They keep fracking it in that in the New England and in, in, in New York Times to show you that information. So there's really no question left here. There just there is no question that um, it is that 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 whether or not vaccines are safer than getting sick. It's clear that vaccines are safer for the people who have gotten sick and then go ahead and get vaccinated. That's like the rock wall of Gibraltar. There. I mean, that's that's a that's a really that's a really mm -hmm. strong immune thing. But I would not run out and get and do that remember that one in 200 people will yeah. die uh that and that's overall and if you're in a higher risk category your risks of death can go up as high as one in 10 or one in uh, one in 20 and so i i just man i would really i would not play russian roulette when you have the answer right there in front of you last question is from isaac are there any vaccines currently being trialed in south africa what is the vaccine situation in that area you know do i don't know the south african vaccine story as much mm -hmm. that we showed that data early on that talked about that and those trials are going on all around the world yeah. so i'm not sure how many are actually taking place in south africa per se i can't remember if maybe the novavax was doing i think novavax it is so there are trials going on obviously and um south africa probably has a little bit more resources than some of the other african nation countries uh, they may have a little bit more but overall to your point yeah i don't the vaccination overall is not as high in the community level as, as we would like around the world for many countries. I'm going to get to some final thoughts. How's that sound? Okay. Dr. Hawkinson, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, again, still a, a lot of news and a lot of questions to be asked and a lot of information to be obtained. We will kind of stay up with you uh, on that and, and try to keep you up with that as well as soon as any new information comes out. Uh, the best things you can do are continue to do those things that we've talked about, those non-pharmaceutical inter interventions such as masking, distancing, doing things outdoors, staying away from those high-risk situations as much as possible, and of course going to get vaccinated to keep you and your bubble or your family as safe as possible. You know, in, in all the days of all the coronavirus news, sometimes I think you have to remember to just take a deep breath mm -hmm. because there's a frenzy right now around Omicron. And uh, the reason we changed this program over the weekend from what it was going to be is we wanted to help answer the frenzy. We want to make sure that people stayed calm. So here's my advice to you today, folks. Take a really deep breath, take a really deep inhalation, exhale slowly, and remember this. The same rules have worked for thousands of years, and they'll continue to work, and they'll continue to keep you safe. Omicron may be different. We don't know yet. But what we do know is that if you follow the rules and if you get a vaccine, you're going to really be protected. And the odds are it'll take care of your Omicron and every other variant. So these changes we read about are new to you. They're not new to science. They're not new to medicine. They're really not new to our health. They've been going on for a lot of years without a lot of attention. But because of the frenzy, there's a lot more attention. 
So we should pay attention to it. We should know about it. We should learn about it. We should all try and educate ourselves. But at the end of the day, let's take a deep breath and remember, we are still building this airplane while we fly it. And sometimes the passengers change. Good advice. So no running around with our hair on fire. No, no. And I don't have any hair left to get on fire. So let's please not do that. I thought about you this week, my friend. You didn't oh, yeah. mention uh, the death of Stephen Sondheim, our, my fellow I theater know. geek over I, here. I am. I am a theater geek. And I did read about that 91 years old, one of the most remarkable history, uh, careers in, in theater ever. I know. Hmm. Fantastic. That's a big deal. See, I said we get a little bit of a, a little ode to Broadway in. We, well, we just should. Just like Chiefs And, and I will say the second episode of Star Trek Discovery mm -hmm. start, went down the last Thursday night. It was awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. So live long and prosper. Good advice for all of us. Yeah. And a little Ted Lasso. Good. What do you got? Ted Lasso is always the best. And just to say, a, a, a death in the design world from angiosarcoma yes. of, of the heart. So, man, that. those are some bad things out there. But remember, faith, hope, science. Keep us alive. Keep the frenzy at bay. I have some final thoughts. Please. And I got pictures to show it. Oh, okay. boy, here I, we I went go. to a 5K this weekend. And Did I you go, run? I said I run from things. Uh -huh. I don't run for things. Okay, so this is Cicely. She is one of our faithful viewers. Awesome. She called me the KU lady. I said, I'll take it. I've been called lots of things. I love you being have, called the KU like, lady. That's a good one. So this is our friend Holly. We were both there for this event that helps promote uh, mental health awareness. And we were supporting our friend Holly. Um, this run was in honor of her brother, Scott Codwell, Caldwell, who served our country with all that he had. This is Scott right here. I just want to show his face. T sadly, 10 years ago, he came home to his country here, lost his battle with PTSD and took his own life. So we honor his memory yesterday and all of the days. And we know so many people right now are struggling with mental health issues. And um, here on this program, we are always helping people to remove the stigma, not just talk about it, but to get active help and and uh, get out there and, and, and make sure you're getting help. So we just uh, wanted to honor, uh, honor Scott and, um, and me running. Yeah, that which Walking is awesome, fast. which I is impressive. And now you got that 1970s belt that looks like it's a mile wide. Well I done, know. Jess. I could do some damage with this <laughs> <Yeah>. belt buckle. <laughs> so it was that Virgil Abloh you were talking about? Yes, it was. Yeah, so uh, prayers out to Virgil Abloh and his family. He was a graduate uh, of my alma mater, Boylan High School in Rockford, Illinois, and right. just went on to do great things, designed and donated some, uh, some sports uniforms to them as well. So certainly the world we missed with him, gone. All right, everyone, thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate you being here on this Monday. We're going to continue to stay ahead of Omicron. We're going to take more of your questions and your thoughts tomorrow. So, so join us back here at 8 a.m. tomorrow. But it has been 40 years since we first learned about another virus across the world. That's HIV and AIDS. So tomorrow we're going to take a look at the theme plan for World's AIDS Day 2021, plus how COVID has helped in finding possible treatments for HIV. We're going to have three infectious disease doctors with us. So a lot of brain power on the panel to discuss this and, of course, the new variant with COVID. So don't forget, you can catch our show anytime on our Facebook page and on YouTube. We will see you tomorrow at 8. Have a great Monday. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.